the fact that people get worked up about what young people are reading has to do with fear and control, right? I mean, no one in these school board meetings is talking about the cell phones that are in their kids' pockets, right? They have immediate access to so much content. And what I think is important about literature and has been in the case of all the books you mentioned and many other works of literature is the opportunities it creates for young people. So rather than focusing on uh, objections parents have, schools can focus on how they are supporting parents, teachers, librarians, students in having difficult conversations that we really need to have. People want to protect children. I get that. We all want to we all want what's best for the children. But I would argue that the way to protect children is not to put them in a bubble and pretend that these bad things don't exist, but rather to give them the tools to deal with the complications and ugliness that life often presents us and that many of these kids are already dealing with. And, and let them discuss these issues in the... Um, the safe place of their classroom. You know, it was banned in a very well-to-do suburb um, in Dallas, and one parent objected to it. And the other parents and the teachers, and God bless them, the students got together and said, we need to know about people like this. We have, we have so many privileges. You know, I identify as a fat black Mississippian, but I wanted young people and people to see that there's space for you to write your story into existence, particularly when these schools ban your eye. And I had my eye banned, and a lot of young people are having their eyes banned. And these book bannings are just further proof of, like, there's a, 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 a insidious group of folks in this country who want to ban our children, not just ban books, but ban our children from exploring identities that they deem fearful. There's nothing more insidious than the work of book banning in this country in 2024. Today is a very special day for us. It's the 100th meeting of the Velshi Band Book Club. And that was just a handful of the incredible authors whom we've met along the way. For two and a half years, we've been speaking with authors, digging into stories, shedding light on the darkness of censorship and book banning. For 100 meetings, we've been reading as resistance. Since we began the Velshi Band Book Club 100 meetings ago, efforts to ban books across the country have gotten worse. It's becoming more common, more accepted, and now it's becoming enshrined in law. There are numerous examples, from Alaska to West Virginia, of state legislation on book banning. But perhaps the most egregious example is in Utah, where 13 books, including work by, uh, works by Margaret Atwood and Judy Bloom, have been outlawed in public schools entirely. And there will be more where that came from. Under a new law, a new state law, it takes just three of the Utah's 41 school district boards to claim that a novel contains, quote, objective sensitive material, end quote, to get a title removed from all schools across the entire state. So today, for our 100th meeting of the Velshi Band Book Club, it feels only right to have back the person who was here with us from the very start for our earliest meetings. The person who has become a true hero in the fight against book banning and censorship. The person whose story touched so many members of our book club. George M. Johnson. You will remember George for their poignant coming-of-age narrative, All Boys Aren't Blue, published in the spring of 2020. All Boys Aren't Blue chronicles Johnson's life from New Jersey to Virginia, from childhood to adulthood, as they grapple with their identity as a black, non-binary person. All Boys Aren't Blue powerfully confronts, confronts agency, self-love, sexual assault, identity, and self-liberation. All Boys Aren't Blue has become more than just a powerful story. It's now a symbol of free speech, of access to literature, and of resistance. Show me the list of banned or challenged books that does not include All Boys Aren't Blue. This book has been removed from library shelves and classrooms from Colorado to Texas to Virginia. George's story, his life of a black and queer person in America, has been made an example of again and again. George has become more than just a successful author. They are an activist, a central voice in this fight for freedom, for literature, for black and queer people, for democracy. George M. Johnson joins me next. Don't go anywhere. 
The 100th meeting of the Velshi Band Book Club is officially in session. I should have got a, a, a mallet or whatever you call it, uh, you know, that thing to, 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 to bring it into session. A gavel, that's what it is, not a mallet. Uh, George M. Johnson joins me, a veteran member of the club, author of one of the first books we ever featured, All Boys Aren't Blue, a memoir uh, manifesto, and the author of the brand new book, Flamboyance, The Queer Harlem Resistance, I Wish I'd Known. Uh, George, welcome. Great to have you back. Yes, thank you for having me back. You first joined the Velshi Band Book Club on February 13th, 2022. What's changed since we, we first talked? Uh, I guess my uh, dedication to writing more stories, <laughs> uh, continuing to write more stories. You know, I'm super excited about my new book, which is on the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, but the book banning has still continued. And I think that's what's unfortunate is despite everything we've done, all of the fighting we're doing, uh, despite the current state of the country, there is still a desire to block certain children from having access to uh, books where they're reflected. And I think as we continue to fight and my book, it was just banned in like Cobb County, Atlanta. So, uh, which is, I guess, technically like a blue district. So it's, it's getting worse as, as time goes on, uh, but we're not stopping the fight. I'm still part of a federal lawsuit in Florida. Uh, we're going to make sure that young adults have the right to read the materials that they uh, deserve to read. Is it the, the new All Boys Aren't Blue was, was banned in Cobb County or, or uh, Flamboyance? Darn Blue was banned in Cobb County last week, uh, which was kind of shocking to all of us because we were like, wait, that's like a, I mean, it's not like a super blue county, but technically it's a blue yeah. county outside of Atlanta. So it was a little shocking. Um, flamboyance has not been banned yet, but I think it's because they don't Oh, it's going to be, my it, friend. But, uh, You're not talking about the Harlem Renaissance. You're talking banned. about the queer Harlem Renaissance. They're going to get banned before this conversation <laughs> is over. Uh, let me ask you something, because when you came on for the first time, our readers, who are not you, they are, they are not uh, youngish, uh, queer, black people. They, they hadn't met someone like you in many cases, and they were excited to read your book, which they would not have known about but for the fact that it was featured as a banned book, and learn something about you. So who loses more when you ban a book? The, the kids, as you say, who can't see themselves reflected, or everybody else who can't learn about those people in the first place because they don't, have, they don't live your experience? Yeah, that's a that's a good question, because it's like we all lose right at the end of the day. I do still feel like those who need to be seen need to be able to read about themselves in a book are going to lose out more. But I think as a society, we lose when people don't understand those who are different than them. I've traveled this country. I remember speaking in uh, a small city called uh, Ure, Colorado, I think less than a thousand population. And I remember being in that room and I was the only black person in the room and 150 people showed up. And I think for many of them, that was probably the first time they had ever met a black queer person. Mm -hmm. And that's what we lose when we eliminate these books because it's like I can't go to every small city but my book can and so we lose out on society we lose out on community uh, we lose out on empathy when all of that happens and I think even with the current uh, situation in Springfield that's a direct reflection of book yep. banning right like you because if people were able to read and learn about other cultures, even in these small cities, we wouldn't have wild stories and wild accusations being made because people would already know uh, what people's culture was and who people actually are versus like stories that get put out and then run like wildfire and people end up believing them because they have literally had no access points to uh, people's culture outside of that. You were interviewed for Time magazine in March, and it had some James Baldwin vibes. You were critical of how some liberal Americans have reacted in the face of book bans. You wrote, quote, uh, or you said, quote, conservatives are loud about it, but what I feel is liberals also agree with them secretly. And I've still not seen enough, especially on the level of prominent government officials, defending the books and other rights in the same way in which someone like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has opposed them. They're not vocal about protecting the books that are being banned, end quote. Let me talk, talk to me more about this. 
Well, one, I want to say shout out to uh, House Rep Ayanna Presley because she is the one House Rep who has put a bill together to try and fight against book bans. But in all actuality, the best way I can liken how silent certain liberals are when it comes to this situation is if you think about like Roe v. Wade, you have people who are pro-life or pro-choice. But realistically, the opposite of pro-life is pro-abortion. It's not pro-choice, right? So a person can say like, well, I'm pro-choice, even though I don't agree with abortion. And so I feel like that's the same thing that's happening with books where it's like, well, I'm I don't want books to be banned, but I also wouldn't allow my child to read this book. And I feel like that's actually what's happening. And so the quiet part is them basically saying, well, I don't think books should be banned, but I actually don't think that your book should be read either. Uh, and that's what you feel, because I always say, like, a person will fight hard for something they truly believe in. Uh, but when that thing is taken away, if they never truly believed in it, then they're not going to fight to get it back. And I think that's what is happening with book bans is you have a lot of liberals who believe in the right for everybody to uh, have the ability to read what they want to read. But when that liberty is taken away, it doesn't move up high on their list to restore that right back because they also weren't in full agreement with uh, the books that were being banned to begin with. George, it's great to have you here. Uh, you've been a great partner in these efforts, and uh, and I thank you for that. And congratulations on the new book. Um, I, I don't know whether I should say I hope it doesn't get banned or hope it gets banned, because either way, the bottom line is you are putting great work out there, and, and uh, people should read it, and uh, they're not going to win if they, if they keep banning books, because we'll just keep talking about them. You'll just keep writing them. Uh, so thank you to the longtime member of the Velshi Band Book Club, George M. Johnson, author of two critical books, All Boys Aren't Blue and the forthcoming Flamboyance.